Just a couple of things real quick before we get into our lesson. As always, we welcome our visitors. If you're here not familiar with the Church of Christ and how we conduct our worship services and you have a question about what you see or that we do, we very simply ask you and challenge you to ask us and we'll provide for you the Bible answer because we want to do all that we do under the authority of our Father in Heaven. Also, a couple of weeks ago, if you'll remember, Brother Carlton and I stood side by side in this pulpit about a disagreement and some words that we had. And I may not have been totally clear, uh, but the question is, did Brother Carlton repent? And the answer is yes. Before we walked up, he said, you and I. And so the I is for Carlton that he has offered his repentance for his absence and other areas in which he had been neg negligent in the Lord's service. And the third thing, I did, and yes, I did look at my watch a minute ago, but it was a worthwhile text that I read. Brother Freeman will be going home today, and Carlton and Cindy and Sheila are on their way to the hospital now to pick him up. So, you can scratch that one off, Mike. Several weeks ago, we began a series of studies, and we're going to continue those on Sunday morning from the book of John. And I know that I have done a sermon or multiple sermons on John chapter 3 and verse 16. But it never gets old. Because every time you look at that verse and you come up with it, you may see something that is a little different. And I want to talk this morning about the Lord's good news. And when I think about His good news, we can go through this passage. And so in a world that we live in, isn't it filled with bad news? It seems like every time you turn your television on, it's always something bad. I happen to think that very rarely do we hear positive stories on the news. However, this week there were a couple of positive stories on our local television station. And yes, they just both happened to be about free argument. One of them was about the positive direction in which the men's basketball program is headed <laughs> under the direction of Drew Stutz. And those are the kind of human interest stories that we need to hear more and more of about those who are making a positive impact upon this world. Not always the negativity that is so prevalent. If you go back in, to the book of Proverbs, and I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 25, and I want you to notice what the proverb writer writes in verse 25, where he says, As cold water to a weary soul, so it is good news from a far country. And I believe what the writer of Proverbs is trying to get us to do and to understand is, yes, there is cold water, that which cools our enthusiasm down. He says, but don't worry about the cold water. He says, because there is news that is going to come from a far land. And so I'm glad to stand before you and report to you this morning that the good news that's contained in John chapter 3 and verse 16 it did not originate in the mind of man, but it came to birth, to be birthed in the very mind of God. And when I think about what that passage says, it tells me something of significance about our God. It tells me something about His love for me, this good news that we need to hear. The good news, not only that you and I need to hear, but the good news that the world we live in needs to hear. Because truly the love of God was given and has been shown for all men. So this morning I want to dig into this verse and I want to share five thoughts with you. And we won't dwell on all of them very long, but I want to share with you five things that I found in this verse. First of all, notice... 
It is a miraculous love. It is a gift which God gave that came to be through a miracle. In the fact that He sent His Son to be born of a virgin. Isaiah 7 and verse 14 says. But I want you to go back and look at the prophet Jeremiah. Because he says in Jeremiah chapter 31 in verse 3. He says, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. I want us to focus on this aspect in that verse of two words that say everlasting love. I want you to think about God this morning and I want you to think about His love for you. And I want you to understand that His love is everlasting. And the reason I can say that His love is everlasting is I can go all the way back, and guess what? We're going back to the book of Genesis. As always, you cannot go anywhere in Scripture without going back to Genesis chapter 3. Because you remember it was in Genesis chapter 3 that Adam and Eve were in the garden, the place of perfection. And the serpent came in and deceived the woman and caused her to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which God had forbid them to partake of. And then she had man come along, Adam, and he also ate of that fruit. But you know, as God came for a visit in the garden, He already knew the answer to the question He asked when He says, Where are you? He knew the answer. He was wanting to see what man would say, what Adam would say, where he was. But do you realize the great love that God shows in this miraculous way begins to be seen in Genesis chapter 3 and in verse 15 in the very first prophecy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because it is in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 that God promised that one would come to destroy the deceiver. And yes, it was in this way that His love, as we read in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 34, down through verse 39, that His love is boundless, that His love is eternal, and that His love is unchanging towards us. You know, we look at this verse and we've read it often. Notice it says, Who is He who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. And then the question comes, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, what things? What are these things that Paul is referring to in Romans chapter 8, verse 37? He's going right back up to verse 35. When he speaks of the persecution, the tribulation, the, the nakedness, and, and all of those things that the people in the early church were facing. Brethren, you and I don't face persecution like these folks did. You and I don't face the fact that we might lose our life because of our faith. But Paul says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Are you ready? Through Him who loved us. In other words, God provided a way for us to conquer the trials, the tribulations, the persecutions that life throws at us. And it says we are able to do it through Him who loved us. But look at verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. In other words, he says there is nothing in the past or in the future that can separate us 
from the love of God. Verse 39. Life is tough, but God loves you. John 3, 16 says, For God, what? So loved the world. You and I are part of that world. And this miraculous gift that He gives, and it is proven to us in what He did and what He accomplished on the cross. Romans 5 and verse 8 says, While we were what? Sinners. Christ died for us. While we were undeserving, the love of God was seen through His only begotten Son dying on the cross. You see, God's love is such that He loves us too much to let us stay in the condition that we're in. God wants what? All to be saved. God wants all of His creation to come to the knowledge of the truth and be in heaven with Him one day. Point number two from John chapter 3 and verse 16 about the Lord's good news is that it is a matchless gift. And when I think about that term, matchless gift, there is no other gift that can ever be given that will match what God did for us. And so I go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I look there in verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 21. It says, For He made Him who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Did you see what that verse says? God sent His Son to die in my place. You remember a couple weeks ago we began in John chapter 2, we, we looked at the invitation to consider and as Jesus was approaching John the Baptist and the others there, what did John say? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Oh, what a matchless gift. Here's a man that is living on the earth that is going to be able to take away the sin of all. Every sin of every man who lived under the old law and it's passed on. Even those who are living under the new law that have passed on. Those of us who are living today and those of us or those of you who at some point in life will put Christ on in baptism. He took your sin upon Himself. You and I deserve to die. But Jesus says... You're more valuable than that, and I will die for you. Oh, brethren, it's a matchless gift. There is no other gift that compares. And, and, and I want you, and I'm not going to dwell on this for an extended period of time, but I want you to think, as it says, of the misery and of the agony of Calvary. And I know that we've discussed this before. Begin with the trial of Jesus. Begin, begin, if you will, in the time in which those accusers came into the garden where one of his own, Judas Iscariot, betrayed him. Brother, we'd say that today, Judas sold him out. Or our kids today might say, Jesus narked on him. Jesus outed, or Judas outed Jesus. And we know that they led him away to a circus of a trial. A trial that was unjust. A trial that should have never taken place. But it did because of this matchless love. And when you think about the misery and the agony of Calvary, think about the scourging Jesus faced before He journeyed to Calvary. Think about the thorn of crowns that was placed on His head. Not gently placed, but shoved down. And then you get to the cross and there you see the nail-pierced hands and the nail-pierced feet 
And then as the spear pierced his side. Brethren, the death on a cross was miserable. It was something that I wouldn't want my worst enemy to go through. And by the way, none of you are my worst enemy. I wouldn't want someone who was my worst enemy to go through what Jesus went through of suffocating on the cross. And then add to the fact part of the agony as He come on the cross were the agitators. Those who were saying, if you are the Christ, if you are the Son of God, bring yourself down. You saved others, but you cannot save yourself. What mockery. But Jesus had this matchless love because He knew He had to give His life for us. Brethren, I don't know about you, but think of all the ways that God has blessed you in this life. I want you to think about all the blessings that God has given to you in life. And if the story and the reality of the cross of Christ does not make the top of your list. I think we have to question ourselves. You cannot ignore what Jesus did for you. I cannot ignore what Jesus did for me because it was a matchless gift. Point number three, it's a very simple message. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever... It is a very simple message. And sometimes we as human beings, we complicate the message. The Bible says in several places that the one who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I realize that our world has a misunderstanding of what it means to call on the name of the Lord. But you go back to Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when the Lord's church came into existence. You remember Peter and the others stood up before that assembly and they were accused of being drunk. Kind of like you and I as Christians when someone says, you're not right in your mind. You're crazy if you think all that stuff in, in the Bible is true. These guys, they said we're drunk. Yet we know that the Bible says that they were full of the Holy Spirit. And they stood before that assembly on that day and they delivered the first gospel sermon, the first appeal for folks to turn back and to appropriate the sacrifice that Jesus offered on the cross. And so when I go through Acts chapter 2, I see that this is a very simple message. Because those in the crowd that day heard the message that they had crucified the very one who came. Wait, wait a minute, let me back up. Crucify is not a strong enough word. It doesn't say this in that passage in Acts 2. But the implication in my mind is you murdered. You put to death an innocent man. The very one who came to save you from where you are. And so in response to that message that was delivered, what did the crowd say? Men and brethren, what shall we do? In other words, they realized what they had done because a simple message convicted them. The Scripture says when they were pricked in their hearts, when they were cut in their hearts, something caused them to stop and to think and to realize that they had done wrong. And so they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And what was the answer that's given in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38? I hope all every one of you sitting here, except our young children, and they ought to be getting this message. The Bible says they were instructed to repent and to be baptized, every one of them, what? For the 
remission of sin. Simple message, isn't it? That's what the Bible says. Or perhaps we need to go to the book of Ephesians in chapter 2 and begin reading in verse 8 and verse 9 where the Scripture says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, but it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Brethren, it is a gift from God. It is our responsibility to share a simple message with a lost and a dying world. And you notice the next one, and I know it doesn't sound right, but it's a quote, unquote, whosoever message. Go back and look at the words of Jesus in John chapter 6. And look at verse 37. John 6 and in verse 37, the Scripture says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. In other words, whosoever will come. The ones that the Father, through the gift, gives them. Or perhaps we need to go over to Revelation, the very last book in the New Testament, and look at chapter 22 and verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say come, and let him who thirsts come, and whosoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. The Spirit is revealed to us through this Word, God's Word, in written form. He's given us the invitation to dig in and to study and once we have done our study and we have learned what we need to do, then guess what it becomes? It becomes our responsibility to share that same love to another. What it boils down to is a matter of faith. I encourage you, if you're not attending our Bible classes, and this is not to slight any of our teachers, not to slight our adult teachers, Chip, but we're studying Hebrews in the adult auditorium class, and we're in that great chapter. Of Hebrews chapter 11 where it tells us about faith where it tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen and then when you drop down to verse 6 we read that it is impossible for man to please God that he must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him and this morning in our class we began in verse 4 looking at Abel and in verse 5, Enoch. Verse 7, Noah. Verse 10, Abraham. And we made the comparison where it says, By faith, they believe that God is. And because of their faith in who He is, their actions led them to understand that He is a rewarder of those who they seek Him. See, brethren, our acceptance of the simple message is a matter of faith. Just as those in Hebrews 11 had. Point number four, it is a marvelous certainty that whosoever believeth in Him shall have what? Shall have that certainty. That is the fact that you and I can trust in God that the security we have is in Jesus Christ. You see, it's His business to save us and to keep us. Let us go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and look at verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5 says this, Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed the last time. It is a certainty that God is going to save us. The certainty of eternal life is there. And you and I as a faithful child of God this morning, we ought to take great joy in the fact that there will be no help for a faithful child of God. 
Oh, eternity is certain. Like the songs we have sung this morning so far have talked about the certainty that's coming. And we're going to dig further into that tonight. Another shameless plug for you. As we look at the topic of when Jesus tries Pilate and the reversal of that trial when Pilate tried Jesus. And I know that it's misspelled in the book. And that is my proofreader and my own fault. We need a one call it. So tonight, when Jesus tries Pilate, and it's going to deal more in depth with the judgment. But then, lastly, That whosoever believeth shall what? Have everlasting life. Brethren, that's a magnificent possession for, for us. It is something that you and I can look forward to. And I want you to understand when it says everlasting life, not only is it a future expectation, it is a promise that's given day by day in the present time as we're living this faithful life to Jesus. See, what it means for you and for me as a child of God, it means that we will never die. You remember Jesus in John chapter 11 brought Lazarus forth from the grave, but He made a promise. He made a promise there in John chapter 11 and let's turn over there and let's read specifically what he says and the promise that he made. In verse 25 and verse 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me, you ready? Shall never die. Do you believe this? The same question should be asked of us today. When we become a child of God, when we appropriate the blood of Christ to take away our sins, and we begin walking that faithful life, whoever lives, we put to death the old man of sin in the waters of baptism. Paul says in Romans chapter 6 that we rise to walk in what? A newness of life. Ready? Whosoever lives the new life and believes in me continues to walk in the light as he is in the light. First John. It says, shall never die. And let me emphasize to every one of you today, do you believe this? Do you understand that the possession of heaven is only for the one who is faithful? You and I, we possess eternal life right now. Brother Ray, how can you know that? John says, These things I write unto you, that you, are you ready? That you may know that you have eternal life. If I know today I have eternal life, it's in my hand this very moment, this very hour. And so, this magnificent possession is not only the future of heaven, but knowing that we possess it this very moment. And brother, and I can talk about what the future holds forever. I can turn to multiple passages in the Scripture, especially in the book of Revelation, which defines and describes the glory and the beauty of heaven. But let me tell you, words cannot really describe the beauty of heaven. Oh, the glory and the splendor. To me, the real beauty of heaven is to be before the presence of my God who created me. The one who provided this good news that I might be able to live with him forever. That's the most beautiful thought about heaven. 
the description of the in the physical of what heaven is like to me, just just throw that out. Just just throw that out, brother King. Because just being in God's presence is going to be the most glorious and most beautiful thing that I'll ever experience. Oh, and I've experienced some glorious and wonderful things in my life, but none can compare to the glory and the splendor of being before God. And so I ask you this morning, isn't that good news? Don't you agree with me that John 3.16, the Lord reveals to us this good news? One of the greatest things, and perhaps the greatest thing about this good news, is the fact that anyone who will come to the Lord, anyone who will surrender their life to Him with an obedient heart that has learned what faith is, they've developed faith, and they want to act upon their faith, and they know I've got to leave the way I lived before, that's repentance. They turn away from sin and turn to the way of God. One who is willing to make the good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the gift that God gave for your sin. And they're willing to be immersed in the waters of baptism to have their sin washed away, that they might, as we've said, walk in a newness of life. Oh, what a wonderful thing to become a child of God. And then we know that one must live a faithful life. And if one is not faithful, I'm thankful God has given us a way to make reconciliation to Him through confession and repentance of those sins. This morning, do we have one who needs to come and put Christ on in baptism? Or do we have one who is here who's turned away? And you need to revive the gift that God provided for your salvation. <laughs> If you have a need for coming home, we'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. If you're not a Christian, we'll baptize you into Christ. And we'll assist you as you journey from this earthly life to the heavenly life. Because as I've said from day one, over ten years ago, when I first said a word in this pulpit, I can't get to heaven by myself. I've got to have you helping me. We need each other. This morning, if you have a need, our prayer is simple. Just come to the front, make your need known while we stand and while we sing. I was seeking deep in sin, but...